Welcome back Dynabytes viewers, it's Gordon here and in this episode I'm going to be looking at Canon's first consumer digital camera, the PowerShot 600. Yep, no 100 to 500, Canon decided to start the PowerShot series with the 600 in 1996 at a price of about £900 or just under $1,000. It has half a megapixel, a fixed 50mm lens, no screen and what would appear to be an unnecessarily large body. So 25 years later, let's find out how it compares. Now, when you describe anything as a company's very first camera, you have to qualify it and mention a few caveats. The PowerShot 600 was Canon's first consumer digital camera, the first in the PowerShot series. But the previous year, in 1995, Canon actually had a few other imaging products. There were the DCS-1 and DCS-3, the company's first digital SLRs, collaborations with Kodak that both employed hard disks in a giant section that came out the bottom of the bodies. Canon also had another consumer-ish product, which was a camera built into a PCMCIA card, but that was really designed for slotting into a laptop, so not really the same sort of market as the PowerShot 600. So I'm fairly confident in describing this camera as Canon's first consumer digital camera. The PowerShot 600 also isn't the easiest of cameras to do research on, due to the fact that Canon reused a similar name for some more common products. There was the PowerShot SX 600HS, a rather popular compact super zoom camera, and the PowerShot SD 600 or Ixa 60, which was one of its really compact models. However, that didn't bother me because I reviewed it the first time around. Yes, I really have been going for that long. 25 years ago, I was working for Personal Computer World magazine, and I actually reviewed the PowerShot 600 as part of our February 1997 group test, where I gave it a recommended award. Not the top rating in that particular group test, but certainly one of the stronger products. Okay, so let's get on. I'm going to start by addressing the literal elephant in the room, which is the camera body itself. Why is the PowerShot 600 so large? Because even back in 1996, this was a big camera. All of the other models that I reviewed in that group test, well, most of them anyway, were considerably smaller. But the PowerShot 600 has a couple of tricks up its sleeve, or at least inside this large plastic body. Sounds hollow, but that's in order to accommodate some rather special things. If you turn it and have a look underneath, you'll see this rather large compartment which houses the battery. And this does occupy a very large portion of the camera itself. But you'll also see this rectangle here. And this opens up in order to connect to a supplied docking station, which has a parallel port to connect to your PC. The idea is, is that you would pop the camera on the docking station and use a supplied twain driver to extract those images from the memory inside the camera. However, the thing that made the PowerShot 600 really special compared to its rivals at the time was that it did actually have a card slot and not just any card slot, but one that could accommodate PCMCIA Type 2 and 3 cards, which means you could put in a PC card hard disk into this camera and record loads of images. Now, I actually have a PC card in here right now, but it's not just a PC card, it is an adapter for a compact flash card, which fortunately I can read today. So this actually makes the PowerShot 600 one of the easier cameras that I've had to deal with uh, for these Dynobytes videos, because I can put in fairly modern memory and actually pull the card out and read it on my computer. And here's one of those Type 3 PCMCIA hard disks of the day, 170 megabytes in size, which was absolutely enormous compared to a typical memory card that might only have one, two or four megabytes on it. And this card branded by Canon was so valuable at the time, I even wrote my name and address on it. Although that is the address of the magazine I used to work for. And that building has long become trendy office space or apartments, certainly a world apart from how it looked when I was working there. But the ability to slot one of these hard disks into the PowerShot 600 is what made it pretty unique compared to most of the competition at the time. The camera is equipped with a one third inch CCD sensor with approximately half a megapixel that generates images with A32 by 608 pixels. But if that's too much for you, and that actually was considered too much for some people at the time, you could reduce the resolution to two lower settings if you preferred. 
Now, the camera would record them as JPEGs. They worked out around 50 to 100 kilobytes each for the best quality versions. And it's also possible to record an audio voice memo with pictures, which sounds quite unusual today, but was actually a reasonably common feature back then. And you could even change the recording format. This camera did support supposedly Canon's proprietary RAW format at the time, but I could never really get it to work. So for me, this was a JPEG only camera. The camera is powered on by a switch to the side, which mechanically opens the actual sensor and lens here. You can pose with the viewfinder up here, but the thing that's taking the picture is down here. If I turn the camera off, you will see that sensor become covered. The lens is described as a 7mm f2.5 with autofocus, although due to the size of the sensor behind it, you are getting a field of view equivalent to 50mm, so fairly long for everyday use. Although do remember that 50mm was, for a very long time, the standard lens on 35mm film cameras. You can also see the built-in flash and a button which allows you to choose whether it fires on every shot or automatically. At the top, we've got the controls and a small LCD screen. I'm going to address that LB low battery indicator right now. Now, as a very, very old camera, you will find that the batteries do lose condition over the years. And this one will only hold enough charge to take a couple of pictures at a time. So I don't have many to show you, I'm afraid. I did, however, manage to charge it using a nine volt supply, even though the camera's DC input underneath requests 10.5 volts. So it is possible to charge these up if you've lost the dedicated charger. As for the actual controls, we've got a mode dial here set to A for automatic. Here's the button which allows you to tag your pictures with uh, audio memos. This is a voice memo with the PowerShot 600. This one here can switch the camera's auto-focusing range from a closest distance of 40 centimeters down to 10 centimeters, so a bit of macro action there. And this button here cycles through the quality settings. Again, economy, normal, and fine, which once again was generating JPEGs between 50 and 100 kilobytes each. Around the back of the camera, you'll see there's no LCD screen. That was still a luxury feature back in the mid to late 90s. So the PowerShot 600, like most cameras of the day, composed its pictures with an optical viewfinder only. Not an SLR viewfinder, an optical one. So you could quite happily have the sensor covered by your finger and you'd be none the wiser. And it also meant that there was no way to actually review the images after you took them. You will have a note. This interesting switch underneath the viewfinder, which switches it from recording color images to black and white ones in case you want to capture text documents. All right, I think that's enough talk now. Let's check out the image quality from the PowerShot 600. Back in 1996, the PowerShot 600 stood out for its slightly higher than average resolution and the ability to not just use removable PC card media, but unusually also the thicker Type 3 hard disk cards, allowing you to record over a thousand images when many rivals were limited to just a handful using built-in memory alone. Today, the most obvious feature that's missing is a screen, but back then they weren't a foregone conclusion and sometimes even seen as a hindrance due to power consumption. The fixed lens also wasn't unusual, although the first models with zooms were already arriving at that time, including the Kodak DC50, which beat the Canon to win that particular PCW group test. One of the most striking aspects of the Canon though was its size, a giant compared to Sony's first consumer stills camera, the DSC F1 seen here on the right, amazingly launched only a couple of months later. The F1 was, however, relying on built-in memory to achieve that size, and until flash cards became smaller and more affordable, Sony adopted floppy disks as removable storage on subsequent models, and they didn't exactly result in small cameras. Technology quickly evolves though, and by 1998, Canon's PowerShot A5 was already looking like an early Ixus or ELF, positively pocketable compared to the 600, and considerably cheaper too. The PowerShots would go on to become an enormously successful series, but it all started back in 1996 
with the PowerShot 600. So that was Canon's first consumer digital camera, which was yours. Tell me all about the models that started your digital photography journey. And if you'd like to see more reviews of vintage gadgets and classic cameras, be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell so you don't miss out. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.